well. But I do hope to have a conversation around this later. Thank you. Okay. Uh, great. Well, why don't we turn to Edna? Um, and uh, I'm sorry. I'm gonna I'm gonna butcher everybody's name because it's because um, I have trouble anyway. Uh, uh, and it um, he's a well recognized blogger, and I'd love to hear your co thoughts about uh, the development of local local content. Yeah. Thank you, Dorothy, and thank you guys for coming to the session. Uh, I have several points that I was thinking about when I heard about relevant content, local relevant content. One of it is that as a content creators, actually creating content is not that easy. We are assuming that people generate content all the time on the internet, but uh, as a matter of fact, the good quality content is not that much. It's not that many out there. Uh, there are a lot and there are plenty of just social content uh, that you can consume and without having to pay anything, but a good professional content could be produced by a professional company or produced by a good quality content creator, for example. And I believe when Dorothy tell me about uh, tell us about all of the all of the projects, the local content projects, there's a tension between globally produced content work and local relevant content as well, I think. In terms of scale production and the uh, and, uh, uh, production value as well. The local creating, the local content cannot, comp cannot be competing with the globally produced content, even though it's produced locally. Uh, so my feeling is that there should be a bit more and we should supposed to discuss about this ecosystem where we can foster and we can uh, finding out which one of this content creator that so far has been doing and creating content for free but now they can also go to another higher level where they can sustain their operation or not operation, sustain their activities by having getting enough revenue so they can do it full time because that's actually how you differentiate between people who do it just for fun and people who do it professionally because then you, you do it for you do you create content for full time so when your livelihood depends on what you produce then your content can gets better and better uh, one of the ideas that I have uh, is that uh, not only creating content online now, not only uh, like not only while, while if you writing something or you posting your photos or you like creating videos, but resharing it, like repeating it on Twitter, for example or liking it on Facebook and adding comment to that content is actually another kind of content as well. And it becomes the overall content gets richer when there is an interaction inside of it. Right? So that's one of the point. If there is so many dynamic conversation and interaction that's what that, that makes social media so interesting. Because not only the original content, but you can also get a lot of people respond in that. Second is that there should be kind of simple innovation on whatever platform that people are already using that gets the content creators some kind of revenue stream. One, one of the ideas that I think is interesting, for example, uh, if you have Twitter following and say you accumulate about 10,000 Twitter following, then you can have separate Twitter followers that pay to get your tweets because there is a value on your tweets. It might not get the 10,000 people who follow you already for free to, to pay, but 10% out of that and they pay $1 a month is already a good revenue stream that you can get. So that kind of innovation came from platform that 
can benefit beneficial to the content creators. I think one of the one of the ways where local content can be relevant and without having to compete with the global content creators, but to this content professionally. Okay, so that's one. Uh, I think I can, I'm going to stop there. So I'm, no, it's okay. I think uh, that's for now. Maybe we can continue on the discussion. Thank you. I, I really would like to talk about um, the observation of attention between that because I think from our perspective and you know uh, we are a global provider of content so I'm going to have a point of view but <laughs> from our perspective I think um, one of the areas that have been so interesting in the recent um, years has been I think the, the ability to say if you can uh, have both a user generated content, the kind of content you're describing in terms of uh, incrementally um, monetizable content, um, uh, uh, it can help build a creative community that is um, a virtuous cycle. It starts to build more local content. There isn't a, a, a competing between the types of content. There is actually kind of one plus one equals three. Um, and so I'd love to explore that um, more fully uh, when we get into the discussion section. Let me turn over to our remote participant. Oh, not here? Okay, well, um, then we'll, we'll go back to our remote participant. Or is he on? Do a video, a pre-recorded video. One moment, while we can go. <laughs> We're going to see if this rebooting works. Okay. Well, I can turn to uh, uh, Giannis. Um, you want? We? I think uh, you have some very interesting observations in in terms of the context uh, of UNESCO's role and more broadly the role that UNESCO plays in this whole discussion um, as we lead into some of the other global events. So. Turn it over to you. Thank you, Dorothy, and thank you for the uh, opportunity to speak about uh, the issue which from UNESCO's perspective is um, uh, one of the most important uh, questions of the modern internet and uh, uh, we try to promote uh, the local content creation um, as, as much as we can. And in order to do so, uh, of course, uh, we need to uh, understand what we, what we are talking. Uh, when we're saying local content. Um, and uh, we, uh, there are a number of definitions of local content, but uh, we prefer, prefer to use the definition that local content is an expression of individual and collective wisdom that is associated with the community, its language, location, professional occupation, ethnicity, values, history, and development. And as you, as you see that uh, the local content is very much uh, uh, associated with, uh, with the language. If we look back um, 20 years, uh, uh, the majority of the content uh, on, on the internet was in English. And uh, of course, gradually it is, it is changing. I have here statistics in front of me uh, suggesting that in 2011 uh, there were uh, 40 uh, three percent of um, uh, English uh, s uh, language speaking internet users, 37 percent Chinese, uh, 30, uh, sorry, um, excuse me, I'm looking to the wrong column, 26.8 uh, percent uh, of uh, total internet users uh, were English speakers, 24 uh, Chinese, uh, 7.8 uh, Spanish, then uh, almost five Japanese, and then in, uh, more or less three to four percent Portuguese, German, Arabic, French, Russian, two percent Korean. In total, um, these ten uh, top languages represent 82 percent uh, of uh, all internet users, uh, and remaining uh, 5,000. Uh, uh, 990 languages existing on the planet represents 17.8%. Uh, 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 so uh, clearly we see that there is a dominance of languages, but it is not an, any more predominance of English language. And the uh, uh, estimate, of course, is uh, that Chinese will uh, take over and will become the biggest uh, language on, on the net uh, uh, fairly soon. 
Nevertheless, uh, the content production is, is an issue, and um, uh, we uh, we thought what what would be the incentives for the uh, government. Uh, what what would be uh, incentives for the government uh, to invest in local content production? And uh, uh, as, as, we, as we heard, there are a lot of uh, competing interests, especially in developing world. And why would government need to invest in uh, local content uh, production uh, that there are uh, uh, bad roads and uh, uh, I don't know, uh, schools are falling apart or, or uh, theaters, uh, roofs of theaters are, are need to be fixed and so on. And uh, we thought that maybe economic angle uh, would be uh, the, the one which would talk to governments. And that was the origin, uh, origin of the proposal to OECD and uh, ISOC uh, to look at uh, this economic aspects of uh, local content creation and to see if there is a correlation between uh, the volume of local content which is kept on local internet infrastructure and the uh, price that internet users, local internet users are paying for, for the for access, access uh, to internet locally. Uh, the, um, there was already a mentioning of this, this um, uh, study. What I would like to say that uh, the first part or the first phase of the study was based on a very primitive set of uh, uh, data. Nevertheless, we already got uh, very uh, the, the uh, sort of conclusions of that there is a direct link and correlation between local. Um, uh, volume of local content and development of uh, internet infrastructure. What we uh, couldn't prove uh, until now is that there is also a link between the uh, access price and the volume of local content. I think that this, this is the uh, 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 task for the second uh, study which is now uh, under construction planning phase. Uh, simply because we, we really find difficulties in finding uh, data, uh, aggregated data, which could be uh, useful for this um, uh, purpose. Now, the last logic suggests that uh, with the uh, fairly uh, uh, credible assumptions, uh, first, that the uh, local internet users would first seek local content and only then international content. That is the first assumption. And the second assumption that um, the uh, local traffic always would be cheaper than international traffic. Uh, so with these two assumptions, logic which would suggest that more local co content you have uh, on local infrastructure, cheaper it would get uh, for the local internet users to, to consume that content. Um, there is also uh, other aspects uh, which already have been mentioned here, and that is the, the quality aspect. Local, local content uh, uh, certainly need to be uh, of uh, quality, and then that would be also incentive for the government to uh, create that local content in order to um, uh, promote uh, its own culture, uh, its traditions to uh, uh, produce uh, content uh, for educational purposes. And uh, uh, here, uh, UNESCO is also uh, working with governments uh, not, not directly linked to, to the project I'm, I was uh, talking about, uh, but in order to uh, invest in uh, uh, development of educational uh, materials which then would be published under open license and could be used, uh, let's say, on in scale of the country or the same language speaking countries, uh, and that that content should be shared, uh, and uh, that would drive also a price price of uh, production of that content uh, in in principle down. Uh, on cultural aspect, I, I would like also to mention um, that there is a lot of potential. For instance, uh, uh, yesterday we heard a, a presentation of, uh, of a project which from UNESCO perspective is uh, very, very interesting and contributes uh, both to promotion of cultural diversity and access to cultural diversity from one side and on another side. 
uh, uh, promotion of local content creation, and I'm referring to the to the project of digitization uh, of uh, uh, Balinese uh, Lontarian pound, no, pound, pound the manuscripts. Uh, Professor Ron Jenkinson is here. He will, will maybe speak a little bit more about it. Uh, uh, and um, but I think that type of uh, activities, which actually uh, require some investment, uh, are really needed and, and should be pr promoted. And uh, if they uh, can be done by using uh, economic incentives, that, that's better. Otherwise, that is uh, largely based on donations uh, of charity of uh, organizations who really care about it. Um, I also I would like immediately react to um, to the comment which was made that local content suffers uh, and cannot compete with global. I don't think so. I, I think it is it is a local mentality which would uh, uh, sort of drive humans to uh, be more curious about uh, local events, local. Uh, uh, happenings uh, rather than uh, go straight and, and then look to the uh, uh, what is happening in the world. If you, I mean, I, I can speak uh, for myself coming from a country with two million people speaking language, uh, which is uh, one of those 5,990 uh, with the reach of uh, 1.5 million people. Uh, everything which is in Latin by, by default is of my interest. And I really uh, don't care. And if there is a, we produce one movie per year in Latvia. And uh, no matter what quality it is, all Latvians watch that movie. Uh, that, that, that is default. I mean, that, that's uh, curiosity. And then, of course, we go to Disney and then we go to, to others. But local, by definition, is very important for, for local people. And uh, that is why uh, th there is a maybe they cannot compete on global scale, and, and local content must probably will never be uh, will never uh, make many people rich unless it is in in one of uh, uh, ten dominant languages in the world. But for local communities, this is a very very important uh, element, and uh, they they they're loyal customers, so to say, and loyalty always pays. Great. I hope we talk more about that too, because it is um, it, uh, clearly a very interesting aspect of the uh, local content creation story. Um, I think I, so it's a good segue to talk uh, to you, um, uh, Professor Jenkins, uh, about the work you're doing and, um, and give us a deeper sense of the true preservation of some um, of local content that otherwise wouldn't, wouldn't be able to be shared in the future. Thank you. Um, the, the project that I've been working on with a team of Balinese scholars and artists who were here yesterday, the whole team was here yesterday, but they can't be here today because today is the beginning of one of the most important Balinese holidays, so everybody's busy making all the offerings that they will display tomorrow. But the, uh, the project is the preservation of the texts that are written on palm leaf manuscripts, and they're written in the old Balinese language. Uh, the letters of that alphabet are called Aksara. And Aksara in Sanskrit means that which cannot be destroyed. But unfortunately, the palm leaf manuscripts are not in, as indestructible as the, ox, the image and the concept of the Aksara. So these palm leaf manuscripts deteriorate over the course of 30 to 40 years. And in the past, they've been retranscribed by hand every 30 or 40 years. But now the people who have the skill to do that are disappearing, and people who have the patience and time to do that are disappearing. So these really precious manuscripts that are central to all the performances, ceremonies, and uh, uh, local wisdom, the architecture, the Balinese architecture, for instance, is based on principles preserved on those manuscripts. The, the ceremonies that priests conduct every day in temples all over Bali are rooted in those manuscripts. Um, the perform dance performances that have become famous all over the world tell stories from those manuscripts. Uh, but they are deteriorating and uh, being eaten by bugs and, it's, uh, and, the, and the Balinese language is also being spoken less and less by children in school. So they learn it in school, Indonesian and, uh, and English 
are taking over. So there's a window of time, you know, maybe in 20 or 30 years, most of those manuscripts w would be gone. And we were very, uh, I've been coming here for about 35 years studying theater. Theater is my specialty. But I realized that all the theater performances and the, the amazing stories that are told and updated in every performance so that the ancient stories are updated with references to current events or terrorist bombings or political corruption. They're all woven together into these old stories and the manuscripts. They're all rooted in these texts. So the Internet Archive Foundation from San Francisco uh, gave an infusion of funds to a team of Balinese scholars and artists to digitize and photograph digitally all these uh, manuscripts. Well, the 3,000 of the primary manuscripts that are in the government's library collection. Uh, and they worked for two years, this team, together to, uh, together with me to photograph them and not only to preserve them but to put them on a website, the Internet Archive website, so that they're available for free uh, anytime to anyone in Bali and anyone over the rest of the world. So, uh, and people have been coming to us, uh, priests who live in remote villages uh, have told us, oh, you know, they're so happy now that they can, uh, you know, they can see these uh, and study them in a way that they couldn't because they're not, not everybody can come to the central library in Denpasar. Um, so, uh, the, uh, and the performers who use these texts to tell stories in the temple ceremonies also have told us that they've used that. And they've also told us how important the Aksara are. One of the performers we, wor we worked with said, in, in one of his performances, he did a performance about preserving the, the, the manuscripts when he knew that we were doing it. He wove it into one of his performances. And he said something that he had said that had uh, quoted from the manuscript dedicated to Saraswati. Saraswati is the Hindu goddess of knowledge and wisdom. Uh, uh, and in that manuscript, it talks about how if the Aksara, the Balinese alphabet, dies, then the Balinese culture dies. And he was very emphatic about that, and his audience agreed with him, applauded him when he said that, understanding that really saving this alphabet, saving the texts that are written in this alphabet, was essential to saving the, the, the life of the culture. Um, and, uh, and he pointed to the building that he was performing in, and said, and the building that you're in now, the, uh, the, the grass roof is constructed according to uh, principles that are laid out in these manuscripts. The stories that I'm telling you are from the manuscripts. The, uh, the medicine that you use to, uh, the herbal medicines that you use to cure different diseases when you don't go to the Western doctors, all of that uh, local wisdom about, uh, uh, about medicine and local medicine, herbal medicine, is preserved in those manuscripts. So um, we've been getting great feedback like that from people who appreciate that it's, uh, that it's, that it's being preserved. So. I guess I'll stop now and we can talk more if you have questions. Great. That's, that's terrific. And um, I, I think we have our remote uh, participant up and running because it's a good segue as well. You're preserving the cultural heritage, the storytelling of generations. And there's also efforts underway here in Indonesia to, um, to build new generation of content creators. And that is in the university context. And we're lucky to be joined by uh, remote participation, Dr. Ari. Satya D, I think I pronounced it correct, um, uh, who is a, who's at the Bandai Institute of Technology um, and is going to talk a little bit about what they're doing to um, uh, educate the next generation of content creators here. There'll be one moment of adjustment. <laughs> okay. Do you need this? Do, do you need this? Or are you? We're, we have it, we just need to adjust. Okay. Here we go. Welcome. <laughs> question is how sound will work. Yeah, that is a question. Sorry, the technology is not yet. I know. Right, it's getting close. Do you need the mic? Do 
you know, I wonder if he can hear us. Can he hear us? Yes. We just can't hear him. I think we're, the technology is just a half step behind all of us. <laughs> so it was a, it's a good plan, but I'm not sure we're up and running while they work on it. How about we, we'll, we'll chat among ourselves here. Uh, <laughs> while we wait, yes. Um, uh, before we uh, ask each other questions, I, do we have any questions in the audience? Okay, great. Tomas? Uh, Thank you very much. My name is Don Hollander from the Pacific Internet, Internet Partners. And I have two questions, if, if I could. The first for Giannis, and I just wasn't sure, but you said there was a link between access price and local content. And I wasn't sure whether you said there is a link or there probably is a link and we just haven't studied it yet. So um, that's... That's, I, I just didn't understand that. Um, and you also said that you assumed that people are far more interested in local content than distant content. And I wonder if that's really, if, that, if that's based on data, or is that just a, oh, well, that makes sense to me, so it must be true. Because I would think if you were interested in local information, you would have that anyway, and you might use new technologies to find out what's happening somewhere else. So that's my questions for Giannis, if I could. And then Professor Jenkins, I thought, great project. As it's being digitized and photographed, is it also being uh, translated into other, other languages at the same time? Thank you. There is another question. Yeah, then I, I, I saw your reaction and I, I knew that this is coming. <laughs> um, indeed, I, I, I said that um, we wanted to prove that there is a, a positive correlation uh, between the volume of local content which is kept on local internet infrastructure and the access price that local internet users are paying for, for that. And, uh, um, we uh, proved uh, that there is a correlation on, between volume of local content and the uh, development of lo uh, local internet infrastructure. More uh, inter internet infrastructure is developed, more local content is available. In other words, the uh, infrastructure development and local content development goes more or less hand in hand. Um, but we did not have sufficient data which would prove the second one, which uh, for UNESCO would be a good uh, conclusion and good argument in discussion with governments. We hope that this will be able to, uh, that this will be proved in the second phase uh, when we will fine tune um, our um, uh, data gathering methodology and uh, we will find new sources of information because this information is not obvious. Uh, most probably it is available, but we need to, f to, to get to that source where this is available. And uh, you uh, did hear correctly assumptions. And assumptions are not based on scientific uh, 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 proof. They are based on my personal experience being a Latvian. Uh, as I said, for any uh, representative of small nation, the local content uh, would always go first and then the um, uh, uh, international content. That, that is also uh, one way how to prove it when you take a local newspaper. You would not see in the local newspaper international news on the, on the first page. They would come maybe on the four, uh, fourth, fifth, or sixth page, and in some cases on the last one. Uh, local content is always, or local news are always on the front page of the, uh, of the uh, newspaper, and it's for a reason, because people are more interested in local than, than immediately international. Uh, and then uh, another assumption was that uh, the local 
traffic would cost less than international traffic. Again, this is based simply on common sense, provided, provided that uh, regulation is correct. Because, of course, there might be situations then um, local traffic might be uh, expensive, more expensive than international, but then, then that, that, is, uh, that is extreme uh, case and, and uh, certainly is not sustainable in the longer run. We think we... Okay, he's going right now and we'll answer the second part of your question <laughs> just so we can, we can participate. Uh, doctor, can you hear us and speak? I cannot hear you, but I think you can hear me. We can hear you. Okay. Super. Uh, please feel free to um, give us your observation. to hear and understand, um, but I think uh, there was a discussion about the digitization um, that is underway at the university. Um, with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to you to answer the question. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you for that question. Uh, it's a good observation because we know that that's absolutely essential to really making these manuscripts accessible and having people refer to them over and over again because even in Bali, only priests and scholars and advanced students can really translate all these manuscripts. So um, we have translated a few. Um, uh, my Balinese colleague and I have created, have, have published a few books of translations that we put on the website for free. The website, by the way, is archive.org slash details slash Bali. Um, all these ma manuscripts are there and there are a few books that include the translations but the next step that we're working on uh, finding support for is the translation. Um, translation not only into English and other, uh, but also into Indonesian so that everybody in the, in, in, uh, in the whole country can have access to them. Uh, but that's, that's really a, an essential step to, to getting people to really use it more and more. 
Uh, there's videos there also, videos of the performances based on those, uh, on those uh, manuscripts. Uh, one of the books has a shadow puppet play translated in three language, Balinese, English, and Indonesian. And that shadow puppet play starts with one of the manuscripts that tells a story from the Ramayana uh, about one of the uh, monkey generals who, uh, one of the demons who stole the identity of a monkey general to sneak in to um, uh, Rama's castle. Uh, and he, but the storytellers tell that story, the shadow puppet master tells that story when he's recounting a copyright trial, a landmark copyright trial that was going on in Bali at the time. Uh, it was the first trial where they were applying copyright laws to a visual artist whose work had been forged. So the theme of identity theft that was in the Ramayana story was transferred to the theme of identity theft in the modern world and copyright forging. And it's a great example of how the old stories are updated uh, and made really relevant. Um, and we translated that one as a good example. But we want to translate many, many more of the texts. Great. I think we have another question. We have, we have two. Yeah, go ahead. We have two questions. You sir, first. I think part of my question, my name is Bernard uh, from uh, Kenya. Uh, I run a uh, company called Nico Harper. Uh, in terms of content, we, um, the uh, what we do is we try to uh, use uh, customers to generate content about the different places they, they visit. Uh, basically, i describe them. In, in Africa, we have a lot. The internet is growing, but we have a lot of, uh, there's lack of content. As in, you try searching for things. Uh, uh, the, the amount of content is increasing, but uh, that kind of uh, finding places or finding information is is still not uh, it's, it's 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 very hard to compare with with other places. So we are always thinking of ways of generating more content and digitizing and putting them online. Um, part of the question I wanted to ask, I think, has been dealt with. Um, in terms of um, uh, in Africa, we have a lot of. Uh, traditions or local content that is not necessarily written. So even <coughs> we can't boast about preserving lots of uh, literature, but I think we should always think of ways of of uh, turning all this all oral literature into, or even different kinds of of uh, cultural practices. We should think of uh, different ways of digitizing them and making them accessible. Uh, and uh, I think. Uh, in terms of, there should be incentives to basically uh, grow access. I think that there, there are always going to be more new ways of, of uh, providing access to such content. I don't know about them, but I think if we place incentives, uh, financial incentives on that, we might be able to uh, find out uh, new ways of even viewing or, uh, or accessing some content that might, uh, uh, that, that might be lost. Um, another issue was um, we used to, uh, we just got a cyber submarine cables in uh, 2005. Uh, there was that issue of uh, having cheaper access uh, leads to growth of content. And for the longest time, I think a lot of, a lot of uh, the country complained about uh, we don't have some marine cables that uh, the access to internet is very uh, is very expensive. Yet there are million dollar companies uh, making a lot of money just selling uh, music, local music, uh, using the telco infrastructure. So uh, there was content, but uh, I worked in such a company. Uh, we we are paying internet even though the content was local. We did not need the submarine cables to go overseas for anything. The music was, the servers, everything was kept inside the country. But you're paying a rate that were, uh, were 10 times higher than, than other places uh, because, because of the so-called lack of submarine cables. So in terms of regulation, as, uh, as, as, as you said, the regulation is very hard for regulation to catch up with um, uh, especially where the <coughs> financial interests are very interested, it's very hard for regulation to be uh, to be sensible. And the people will just make try to make money. So I think we should figure out 
ways in which um, we can influence policy such that uh, that uh, we have a regulation that is sensible. I don't know whether I've made sense or. <laughs> No, it, it makes a lot of sense, and I, it might be a good opportunity just to, I'd just like to bring Raj in, in this, because I know um, ISAC has done a lot of work in the context, in Africa, in creating some more rational infrastructure for the transport of um, uh, of um, rich media, because it, it was, as, at least my understanding, the undersea cables, of course, added capacity, but there was also routing issues where the traffic had to go in various different places that caused added costs. It also created uh, problems um, with respect to uh, latency and poor quality. And, um, and but, but with some investment that has been going on with private companies and also the government, you're seeing um, s some great improvements in the infrastructure for quality content, which has led to the more creation of co quality content, both user-generated as well as uh, professional. I don't, if you want to comment on that. Um, yeah, and, and the basic piece of infrastructure that's required are called Internet Exchange Points, or IXPs. Um, ISOC has been involved in setting up IXP infrastructure for several years now, uh, and in Africa in particular we have a, substantially, a substantial project that, that addresses that very issue. So the issue you mentioned was that, you know, uh, let me give you a scenario. Three ISPs in a city, each of those three use a different gateway to connect to the Internet. If there is no IXP, to help them route between themselves locally, yes, your cost will go up because your data has to go to somewhere else, for example, it may go to London, and then come back down to you through the, uh, through the other ISP. So that's a substantial add-on cost, and of course, in the end, the user will pay for that cost. I mean, when you subscribe to your internet connection, either you pay cost in terms of the dollars you pay, or you pay by having a lower speed connection, or a more high latency connection, or things just don't body load because it's just too slow, because it's going off to another continent and then coming back to you again. So IXPs are a very critical piece of the local internet ecosystem, um, if you like. Um, it's something that we've been promoting uh, very heavily across the world, not just in Africa, but in, in Asia as well. Uh, Asia Pacific has been somewhat lucky sometimes because you know, uh, the IXP thing here has been ongoing for quite a while. However, that doesn't mean that there is no need. Same thing with Latin America uh, and so on. So. Um, you know, as we start developing the local internet ecosystem, you know, we also start thinking about, okay, now we've got the local content, but how do we actually ensure that local content is accessed in the most efficient manner? And IXP is one part of that puzzle. Not the only part, but one part of the puzzle. Of course, international connectivity is always a requirement. Uh, you need to connect to the global internet, because that's the whole thing about the internet. It's a network of networks. But for, at, at the very local level, IXPs are very important. And then, of course, you must have redundant international links as well. As well, um, I think you said, well, while you were speaking, it occurred to me, uh, you're talking about, you know, we're generating a lot of local content. But the other issue, of course, is how do you actually find that local content? Yeah, where do you keep it? You know, if you keep it in the States and you want to access it from Kenya, hmm, okay, maybe not the most efficient solution. And at the same time, you know, how do you index it? How, how do I know that you've created the local content? Where do I go to find it? So there's some rather questions around there that I think we also need to look at uh, as we go. Thanks. Great. Yeah, we, have, uh, we have some more questions back. Yep. Thank you. Um, I'm Mr. Mr. Yor. I'm from Denmark, from the Danish Film Institute, which, which is a government agency covering all aspects of film production and film consumption in Denmark, including uh, safer internet issues and also film classification and so on. And I, uh, you can say that Denmark is a very small country like uh, Latvia. We have five million uh, inhabitants, and, but we have got a very strong uh, film sector and also a very strong television sector for uh, many years. Just to give you an example, uh, we, we create, let's say, around 20, 22 Danish feature films per year. This is 10% of the market, but we take up to 30% of the market share, and we've done that for the last 15 years. Okay, and our television penetration, I think our two public service stations, I think they have 80% penetration in use. So you can say we are, we are a local content paradise in Denmark to a very large extent, and uh, I think we can compare ourselves to other European countries in, uh, in this respect. But in 2012, we had a shock because Netflix was coming in. 
we had iTunes coming in and we had HBO coming in at the same time. And a lot of people, especially young people, they went through these services instead of watching Danish television, instead of watching Danish films. So we had some kind of shock and we're still, well, shocked in Denmark because can we keep up our local content community in Denmark having these OTT services also on the internet? So you can say my question is uh, to UNESCO, the, the representative from UNESCO, and when you look at the, the regulatory framework for, can say, local service providers on the internet like streaming services or cable TV services and compare them to OTT services, what is actually at stake here um, and, and how do you cope with this seen from the UNESCO side? And my question to uh, Disney, not to Disney as a company, but more like being a company from Hollywood, how do you see uh, the role of Hollywood in the future? Do you see Hollywood as having a stronger partnership, in, uh, partnership with the local industries creating also professional content? Thank you very much. Can I, I'll, I'll start and I'll hand it over uh, to Janice. I, a couple of um, observations. Uh, one is the, the idea that, um, uh, and I will speak more from uh, Disney as a broader company, both in Hollywood uh, uh, major motion pictures as well as um, in our uh, media products and our inter interactive products and our online products. Um, we have seen the growth of the alternative platforms, the digital platforms, as an, a market opportunity, not as a market threat. Um, uh, it is, uh, it is, takes some adjusting from the perspective that business models, uh, had, um, you know, their, the delivery of professional content had been, um, had been, uh, uh, a part of a particular kind of business model that involved windowing and it involved, um, uh, multiple ways of maximizing the IP investment. But, um, but Disney has always been a forefronter in the forefront of adopting the technology. So every time a new platform has come out, whether it's iTunes, um, whether it's uh, um, Netflix, we have been the first major content studio to be participants on those platforms because we see the ingestion of the digital medium as a enhancement to our product and, um, and new ways to create content, whether they're behind the scenes kind of uh, uh, stories, whether they're uh, localized in by using different kinds of um, actors and voices, those are all new markets for us. That's how we see that. Um, and, and as I mentioned in the, at the outset, uh, we also see the international community and local stories as being very significant as uh, parts of uh, the advancement of Disney's um, new view. Uh, Hollywood movies will always be a major element of, of uh, our production, but in finding the creative storytelling, um, rich traditions of storytelling, we've, we're finding them from all over the world. The internet is actually a really interesting medium to find talent, to find um, to find new sources of um, of a, 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 a material, and um, and and so it's it's actually in, in the acute self-interest of Hollywood to be thinking global, um, and we certainly view it that way. Uh, and we also, as I said, view the digital medium as something that is incredibly uh, productive for us, and hence why we're involved with this conversation here today. So, and I'll turn it to you. No, thank you. I, I cannot answer your question. Uh, simply, I don't know. I, I don't think that UNESCO uh, has a capacity in analyzing um, the, the regulatory framework of, of each uh, individual country. So we're look, looking at trends and, and uh, I, don't, I don't think that we are doing this. Uh, in Garda, am I right? Yeah, we're, we're, we're not doing it, at least in, in this context that, that you are saying. We're, uh, we're doing some other, other things when it comes to regulatory framework, specifically on freedom of expression, uh, uh, looking at that, uh, the existing regulations in, in our member states are conducive to freedom of media and freedom of expression on media uh, in that respect, but not um, sort of um, uh, how um, the uh, local uh, regulatory framework supports uh, cultural uh, uh, production of, of cultural uh, uh, sort of goods. Okay, we have some more questions. Uh, my colleague from UNESCO. Uh, oh, colleague from UNESCO? Oh. Just a 
Sorry, and I'll come Just back to help you answer the question. Yeah. Um, I'm Angarda Angar Kaczynska, Reputer Bexa. I'm working together with Yanis Karpnitz at UNESCO. So just uh, maybe a little bit to contribute to, to the answer what uh, Yanis Karpnitz said. Uh, we have a recommendation which is, uh, relates to universal access to, to information and multilingualism. And um, that is not a binding document at UNESCO. This is a normative instrument. And every four years, member states of UNESCO, including Denmark, should provide reports how, what kind of measures we took during the last four years to facilitate multilingualism on cyberspace. And that includes as well local content. And this is where it comes information to us what kind of changes took place during the last four years. If we include in that report those changes, we know about them. If not, we do additional search. We try to identify what kind of trends. But in reality, we don't go to every single individual country to look what kind of uh, new regulatory changes happen. Well, I think the problem I'm, I'm trying to address here is not a, just a Danish problem. I think, just to give you an example, a Danish television series is not available on the Danish version of Netflix, but it's available on the American version of Netflix because the licensing, the, the, the license, le, 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 sorry, the licensing uh, agreement with the American Netflix is much easier to achieve. In, uh, compared to the European because we have, in Europe, we have to go all through all 28 European countries in, in, in the European Union in order to bring it out, bring it out there. And also there's a tradition that when you sell local content locally in Denmark, you keep, you, you need a high price, but when you sell it to the American version of Netflix, well, just, just take it. And now we know that Danish people and all over the world, they can access our Danish content on the American Netflix to a gateway through the Danish Netflix. So there's a mess around licensing content. And if we want to keep, you know, the professional economy in Denmark in order to continuously produce high quality content in Denmark, this is a huge problem and it's not only Danish. Thank you. All right, finally, your turn. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Mwendwa Kivuva uh, from ISOC, Kenya. Actually, UNESCO had a, a, a very good program in Nairobi where we were translating technical computer terms into local languages uh, involving teachers and students and it was actually a very good initiative. Uh, the point I want to get to is about sensitization. Content development has traditionally been left to experts like bloggers, journalists, web developers. Yet, absolutely everybody can develop content. We need to sensitize the population that they have the capacity to build content, including teachers. For example, all they teach, when a teacher expires, or retires, sorry, all the local experience that they had on their students, that goes with them because that content has not been digitized, for example. Same with farmers. When a farmer reaches maybe 70 years and is retiring, all the relevant local information he has collected in all his experience just goes like that. Yet even the local farmer has a lot of knowledge and content that he can be able to, to give to the community. So if we sensitize the local community that they can develop content on their own, not left to experts, that will actually be a very, very good idea. Thank you. We have another com comment, sure. Yes, thank you. My name is Robert, and I'm from the Netherlands, a young entrepreneur uh, involved in several startups as well as uh, I uh, lead a huge group of 500 uh, young talents under 20 years old that are actually involved with building stuff. And um, one of the great things we see over there is that they actually connect with uh, youngsters in all other kind of countries uh, to build things together. And um, what I want to uh, tell today is why don't you all uh, open your vision and change it in a way like Disney does. And um, seeing the way that you can uh, digitalize and put local content online as just a step into the direction of publishing and opening up your doors open to the world. I mean, 
It's a great thing. Your uh, Danish series are uh, viewable in the U.S. and in the Netherlands as well. And um, uh, it, it, it needs a change of mindset to be able to open to the world because opening to the world actually means, yes, you have to change the way you earn money. You have to change your business model of your movies and you have to adapt to the largest one, for example, Netflix. The same happened with uh, Spotify as well. You see, okay, uh, producers change their mindset, okay, Spotify is a way to expose our uh, artists and get them out there in the world and then we can promote them and then we'll earn our, get revenue from, for example, our shows we do. So, um, and I don't know the clear answer for how you can change a business model uh, for series like that, but um, uh, all I want to say is change your, uh, or try to adapt to this change and try to open up your um, your vision to the world and, and change it to a strategy to open up to different uh, business models and, and trying to adapt to it because in the end if you have great content out there locally uh, it's even more awesome to have it out in, in the world uh, and open there and um, going back to the first question or actually the, um, uh, the larger question how can we uh, help governments or help multi -stakeholders, other multi-stakeholders to change their policy or what policy should they have to um, have a great impact on local content as well as pushing towards this global market or opening, opening up doors to other people. I think that is the only uh, uh, important thing in your policy is try to encourage people and try to actually teach people English as well or Chinese maybe if that happens to be the biggest language on the internet to make it easier to open up. So that's one, just one of the ideas in mind sparks that I want to share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, please. Hello, my name is Caroline Murianki uh, from the Communications Commission of Kenya, Regulatory Authority. Uh, my, uh, my question is with regards to a comment made by UNESCO on incentives you mentioned something about incentives for government to invest in local content production. Do you feel that uh, government should be involved in the development of the production or develop the necessary uh, uh, framework or environment to facilitate content production? I would also want to just uh, highlight that we are uh, sensitive or aware of uh, issues of uh, local content uh, issues in Kenya and uh, this has been uh, highlighted in our recently uh, launched uh, national broadband strategy for which we have uh, outlined uh, some of the strategies to facilitate development of local content but I would like uh, UNESCO's uh, view or uh, propose on how we could uh, uh, have governments uh, participate. Thank you. And I'm going to let him answer that question, but I do, since we've had several uh, representatives from Kenya here, I, I would like to say from the perspective of, an, um, of a business uh, looking at uh, opportunities in new regions, Kenya is one of the great examples of the, of the framework in place that promotes uh, both local, the development of locally, uh, of local uh, content as well as locally relevant content from us. Uh, uh, Kenya has a um, uh, a tradition of uh, freedom of expression. It has a solid um, uh, system of uh, intellectual property protection. It has a developing e-platform for payment systems, all of which are ingredients to being able to build a robust um, uh, a robust content uh, um, generating community, and um, so I, I just applaud the fact that we we heard some bad e examples of uh, regulatory policy that may not be keeping up. Um, I would suggest that if you look at the climate in Kenya, it's really a great example of a of a, of a government that has taken a commitment to developing this. So, um, pass. yeah, th thank you. I, I think the uh, answer is to your question is both. Uh, first and foremost, government should ensure that there is a, a proper enabling environment which stimulates uh, local content production in, in, in all its forms. And, and secondly, uh, uh, some part of um, uh, cultural industries are subsidized by governments. And if uh, governments need to uh, 
uh, sort of decide where to allocate scarce resources, then there should be also a political will of government to uh, devote a certain amount of money uh, to, uh, to subsidize uh, uh, production of uh, cultural goods uh, locally. Hello, uh, my name is Khaled Hijab and I'm from uh, Amman, Jordan. Um, representing civil society here. So um, a couple of questions. Um, um, our friend, the blogger here, was talking about social media, about content, about the different kinds of content, and then we talked about content that's generated regionally and then globally. Um, I do agree that local content suffers. But then I would compare it to a, re uh, to a regional experience. But before that, let me just ask whose role is it to create content or rather quality content? And how do we classify quality or just content on the internet? Um, from a regional experience, I mean, the social and political transformation which has, which has happened or took place in the Arab region. One would think that a quantum leap in the production and access of Arabic content through social networks um, has happened. Um, yes, it is true that the Arabic language has, the Arabic language has jumped to the seventh position um, in, the, in the list of top ten languages on the Internet by 2011. Yet, uh, Arabic language on the web only constitutes to less than 1% on the Internet. And that's a bit too scary, especially given, given what's happened in the Middle East recently. And if I want to talk about content, I mean, we have not seen a region that's produced more content than the Arab world just in the past couple of years. So if all of that hasn't been counted as content, then what is content? Um, so far, the Arab region, um, uh, for the Arab region to reach 50% marked by 2015, that's set by, by the UN, is quite a challenge. Um, Wikipedia, in its 20th report, said in, in 2000, and that's 2010, that out of uh, 125 million articles, um, um, uh, or 15 million articles on the internet, only 15,000, only 15 out of 15 million was in Arabic. And um, um, 500 articles were, were really 500 articles were reported by Wikipedia to be called quality articles. The rest were just not verified. Not so. So that brings me to that brings us to less than 0.82 percent of really quality content that's in Arabic on the internet. So the same question: What makes Good content. What is good content? And what's your role? Who's supposed to, or whose role is it to produce good content? Representing civil society here, and and looking at UNESCO. I'd, I'd question what is UNESCO doing in in order to kind of motivate civil society to produce content? Aren't, for example, libraries the right place to to produce content? Aren't NGOs supposed to encourage people to produce to produce content? Thank you. Um, and Matt, do you want to comment on that? Because you are, in fact, <laughs> Thank you. I think one thing that we can agree here today is that very, there is a very diverse content out there, right? So we haven't yet begun to categorize what kind of content that we are talking about. There is one that is a, a, about local wisdom content that is fancy, like Professor Jenkins trying to protect. Right, so that one, I I I've, I've seen that as a uh, a noble effort to protect and preserve local content that is already exists, and without protection will be gone forever. So that's one which I'm not sure I've seen any business model out of that. So either you need to have government trying to protect it or someone like Professor Jenkins trying to protect it, but so far you put it on the internet for free without, ha without anybody having to pay for it. And uh, there, is, there is no business that coming out of that, right? So there is that one category of protecting the local content. And the other part of content is, like you mentioned, the good content is, I think, a content that in my opinion, and this is not on based on any data or anything, but just my assumption is that uh, a content that people are willing to pay or pay attention to. So it does not have to be in the amount of 
currency but could be something that people are willing to go and put an effort to get it right so there are plenty of an actual content like what happened in the Arab world which is I think categorized under actual content but it's something else that it's on YouTube now, for, for example. People are still watching old videos of, um, uh, old video clip of songs from the 50s, from the 60s, and it keeps growing by the millions of people who, who, was, who, was, who watch that. So, there is, again, there is that in another category. But what is, what I'm interested in is in, in I think it's in, it's also in the context of having university participating in this panel is that there is a new uh, online and digital creating this new platform where now, nowadays, people who create content can easily, if they're good, they can easily get distribution channels without having to invest on, on anything, but they can easily get in revenue, amateurs, create content creators can get revenue out of that and competing with the global uh, content producers. And so this kind of content, local content, need to have sustainability and support to be able to keep producing the content, the local one. So education is of course, of course one of them that need to be, uh, need to be, to get stronger infrastructure is another, but also freedom of expression. Of course, this is all the regular things that we, regular basic requirements if we want to create good content. So, I think one of the things that I think should come up from this discussion is that we should map out all of the dif different content, diverse content that is, is actually out there. From the example in Africa, from the example of in, uh, in Arab, from the example in, in, in Europe, in Denmark case, which I think uh, not, cannot be categorized or solved in just one, uh, or summarized in one discussion or so, or one issue. So I have a so I um we're running into the end of our time now. We have one more question. Does that yes? Okay. Okay. Um I wanted to give an opportunity for anyone on the panel to to mention I, I think it's a that was a fitting conclusion for what we've been talking about because there we've talked about all the different forms of kind of content as well as the um, the institutional or capacity necessary to continue to generate that content. Um, it's unfortunate that our, our um, colleague from the university wasn't able to fully participate. We, um, it, because they are doing very interesting things um, uh, at the uh, Band Out Institute of Technology, the university. One of the things that we've done, for example, in building, um, create, trying to create help for monetizing the incentives for the creation of local, uh, locally relevant content is, is building prizes and app uh, awards, which uh, the Walt Disney Company is building with um, the, um, the university here in Indonesia and would like to do that elsewhere, precisely for the kinds of things we talked about where early on it's very difficult to get local voices to have the, um, the uh, financial support, which you know, you're acutely aware of as a blogger and trying to find ways to continue to have your voice heard um, and um, but as that um, as the business model and the cost of producing that content come down and the interest globally of that uh, content both directions both in terms of locally relevant content to individuals as well as um, uh, local content that is more broadly interesting to interested to the global community I think you're going to see more and more hopefully more and more capacity being built in that built uh, into the internet economy overall. Uh, do you have any concluding comments that you want to make? Yeah. Oh, thanks. I think it's been an interesting discussion. I think it covered many different spheres of uh, or many different dimensions perhaps. Um, so I don't want to say all that too much. All I wanted to say was that you know, technology, in, it's really up to us how we use technology. Uh, the internet has been uh, seen and been proven to be an empowering thing that has uh, eventuated over the last 20 odd years in the public domain. Um, and it's really up to us, us as individuals and users, on what we do with it. 
Um, apart from that, I mean, there's this questions about uh, what's quality content, how do you define this and that. So uh, I remember a little saying that my grandfather used to say to me, he said, one man's treasure is another's rubbish. <laughs> thank you. Well, I want to thank you all for coming, and I want to thank our panelists for an engaging conversation. So, thank you.